This is the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. In this episode, we're exploring some of the research that's happening in the Burgess Foundation archive. This is an important part of the Foundation's work, and we are currently collaborating with the White Rose College of Arts and Humanities, or ROCA, in order to give the opportunity for doctoral students to undergo additional training in their chosen fields. ROCA is an AHRC-funded doctoral training partnership between the Universities of Leeds, Sheffield and York. All of ROCA's PhD students spend a month outside of their regular academic setting to conduct a project of direct benefit to an outside organisation. Doctoral training with ROCA focuses on giving researchers the skills and experience to thrive within or outside of academia ultimately benefiting the UK economy and society. They take a collaborative approach to this training, working with organisations such as museums, galleries, archives, libraries, heritage organisations, creative industries, publishing, performing arts and charities. In 2021, the Burgess Foundation has hosted doctoral researcher Milena Schwab Graham, who has been working with a series of 16 recordings from the audio archive in order to ensure that the collection remains accessible for future generations of Burgess researchers and enthusiasts. This placement forms part of the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities Researcher Employability Scheme. Milena is a Rocker PhD student at the University of Leeds, where she is researching the work of the writers George Eliot, May Sinclair and Sylvia Townsend Warner. She was awarded both her undergraduate degree and her master's from the University of Liverpool and has taught British literature and culture at the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany. In 2014, she was awarded the George Eliot Fellowship Essay Prize for her article on Daniel Dorona and Ludwig Feuerbach. She can be found on Twitter at mschwabgraham. I'm Graham Foster of the Burgess Foundation and I spoke to Milena about her work at the end of her placement in August 2021. Hi, Melena. Thanks for joining us on the Burgess Foundation podcast. We're really excited to hear more about the the project you've been undertaking in the Burgess Foundation archives. Um, But before we get on to that, uh, we'd like to find out a bit more about you. So can you tell us a little more about your doctoral research? Yeah. um, Hi, Graham, And thank you so much for having me on the Burgess Foundation podcast. Um, yeah, so to give you a bit more information about my own research, I'm I'm doing a PhD in the School of English at the University of Leeds. Um, and what I'm looking at is how the writers George Eliot, May Sinclair and Sylvia Townsend Warner use walking as demonstrative intellectual praxis in their novels. So what I look at is how they kind of use their own walking experiences. So um, that was in some cases walking you know, out free from social constraints out in the countryside, um, but also walking as a form of political activism um, and how they kind of feed this into their novels. So um, in George Eliot's case, that's, um, for example, that she was out walking in in Europe with uh, her partner, George Henry Lewis. Uh, For May Sinclair, who was uh, writing in the early 20th century, um, She was also involved in the suffrage movement. So I'm looking at how she uses um, sort of walking as part of suffrage demonstration in her novels. Um, And for Sylvia Townsend Warner, who's writing um, a little bit later, um, she's also interested in walking and how it connects up with um, communist activism and um, anti-fascist activism. That strikes me as quite far away from from the world that, that Burgess himself occupied. So Mm. how did you you find out about the Burgess Foundation? Well, the way I found out about the Burgess Foundation was that um, I was aware that um, the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities, um, of whom I'm um, a member as as, um, someone who's on a scholarship, have a partnership with uh, the Burgess Foundation. And so I had seen that um, previously the foundation had uh, done a project working on Burgess's Shakespeare lectures. And so I started to sort of find out a bit more about what the archive actually does. And I was just really, really intrigued because I don't know, Burgess just is such a fascinating character. And I love the idea of actually getting the chance to sort of delve into into recordings because it was it was just something really different from what I'd had a chance to experience so far. And, and did you know about Burgess before you started at the Burgess Foundation? Were you... Had you read many of his books or or are you a complete newcomer to, to, um, to, 
to be honest, I really didn't know that much about Burgess before I started. You know, I was I was familiar with A Clockwork Orange, of course, and I I did know that he'd you know done some like literary criticism, but yeah, I really had no idea about just how um, how kind of multifaceted he is as a character and and um, just how prolific he is as well. So yeah, I, I kind of knew him a bit as someone who was um, you know writing more almost more kind of. Uh, dystopian fiction and things like that as well and and being more kind of experimental in terms of language but as I then discovered you know working on the project this is only one one aspect of the many many different sides of, of Burgess's work and his kind of intellectual preoccupations. So you've been working at the Burgess Foundation since since March is it? Yeah since March yeah. Yeah so we're now in uh, August so you've been mm. you've had a good stint of time working in the Burgess Foundation archives can you tell us a little bit more about the work you've been doing at the Burgess Foundation? Yeah of course so I mean what I've been doing really is I've been delving into the audio recording so I've been looking at a selection from the very extensive archive held in the in the foundation and so I've I've really been listening to a range of recordings from the sort of roughly from the late 70s to the early 90s which cover a whole range of subjects. So it's a lot of interviews which he gave with um, with different media um, and some lectures which he also gave, you know, public lectures on things like modern literature, for example, or um, on morality. So what I've really been doing is looking at this selection of the audio archive and I've been cataloguing it. So I've been trying to find a way to make this material accessible to anyone who's you know interested in Burgess and who maybe wants to find out a bit more about his his life and his work, I've been trying to find ways in which to um, you know describe the contents of these different recordings. Which, I mean, they're so fascinating because they cover such a wide range of topics. And I mean, the wonderful thing about Burgess as well is you don't you never quite know what direction he's going to go in as well. So it's been a really enjoyable experience of um, producing like um, an item level. A description for, for these recordings and sort of moving on from that I then also been involved in um, you know indexing so again making it um, making the collection accessible to to anyone interested in Burgess and I've also been finding out a little bit more about um, some of the things he's been writing as well so this has involved also having an in-person archival visit to the foundation Um, which has been a really lovely compliment to conducting what's been remote archival work, you know, because of COVID. Yeah, it's just been a very, a very interesting experience overall. So the the tapes that you've been working with, can you tell us a little bit more about them? What what sort of state are they in? Are they professional recordings? Are they they, uh, private recordings? Can you tell us just a little bit more about the variety of stuff that you've been working on? Mm, Of course, yeah. So, So there's a really big range, actually. So um, quite a lot of them are non-commercial recordings. So some of these are, for example, recordings of lectures he gave. For example, he he did a series of lectures for The Guardian as part of the film festival. And then there's also other recordings which are more like interviews which he's done. So there's, for example, a few where he's been um, in conversation with Swedish journalists for Swedish media. So these are conversations that are taking place in hotel hotel lobbies <laughs> and restaurants and things like that. So they're, you know, things which are like more of the kind of non-commercial recordings. Um, But then there are also a number of commercial recordings in this collection that I've been looking at. So there's also been a selection where he's been guesting on various radio programmes. So one of them that I was looking at, for example, was when he was a guest on the Larry King show uh, for Larry King's radio programme. And another example is one where he um, is in conversation with Michael Schmidt for the third year programme on BBC Radio 3. And so there's there's a real range, really, of, of, um, of recordings in terms of the kinds of format in which he's, he's talking about his ideas. And you really do see the differences as well in his, his register as well um, and the way he kind of tailors his ideas to that specific audience. So, for example, with some of the, um, the lectures, they then also have question and answer sessions at the end where you then also get lots of room for kind of spontaneity and and you know you see him kind of reacting off the cuff to to different questions as well um so in in your third year of your phd you have quite a lot of experience with the 
with researching your own project. So how does the Burgess Foundation fit into your own doctoral studies or even your own wider interests? Mm. Yeah, it, that's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the things which also initially drew me to the project, I think, is that I was really intrigued by how Burgess kind of experiments across different forms and how and this was something that really came out as I've been working through this project, that he's so interested in different forms of creativity. You know, he's interested in composition, both as a kind of musical mode and as a literary mode. And he really has these kind of polymathic tendencies. And I think that's something which is really a quite strong sort of thematic connection to my own doctoral research, because the writers that I'm looking at, so George Eliot, Sylvia Townsend, Warner and May St. Clair, are also much like Burgess, interested in lots of these um, more abstract connections between different creative forms. And they were also very prolific um, across lots of different forms. So, I mean, George Eliot and May Sinclair were, like Burgess, um, very involved in literary criticism as well as fiction writing. And Sylvia Townsend Warner is someone who's also got quite a lot of connections to Burgess because she like him started off as a composer and was very interested in working within music and only then sort of moved on to fiction um fiction writing and biography so I do think there's a lot of kind of parallels in terms of you know these these creative minds wanting to not just have one particular outlet for their ideas and and, and sort of the way in the ways in which they're preoccupied with different modes of creative expression is definitely something that I think, links the, the, the work I've been doing on Burgess to my own doctoral research. And, and in terms of, of the, the writers you're, you're researching, in particular, Sylvia Townsend Warner sounds like a very Burgessian character. Uh, mm. We know Burgess, Burgess knew of Townsend Warner. He owned a copy of her biography of T.H. White. T.H. Uh, White's uh, The Once and Future King appears in Burgess's 99 novels. Um, I wonder if you've discovered any unexpected connections between those two writers or, or indeed any of the writers that you're, you're studying that you, you didn't really, you weren't really necessarily looking for, but, but they presented themselves to you. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Burgess and Warner definitely shared an interest in musical composition and literary composition. Um, and, but I mean, Warner was someone who, you know, she studied the piano. She, um, you know, like Burgess, she was a piano player. Um, and there's actually even been some speculation that um, she was due to study with Arnold Schoenberg in Vienna and that this was thwarted by the outbreak of the First World War. And of course, in the recordings as well, Burgess talks about his his interest in Schoenberg and in that kind of period of, of more kind of modernist music. So they definitely both share a kind of creative creative path in, in terms of having sort of ambitions to be very successful composers. Like Burgess talks about, you know, wanting to be like, like Beethoven um, and, and Mozart. And Warner herself also has like these very, very strong ambitions. Like she took part in um, a Carnegie um, composition competition when she was a teenager. They both share this, this sort of move from one mode to the other. But also I think they do share a preoccupation with um, the writing process and the sort of the closeness which they develop to their literary subjects. And almost in a way that's kind of haunting them. Because this is something that you see certainly in, I don't know, for example, Burgess's Beard's Roman Women, where you have these f- strong female characters, um, and particularly the character who's very similar to his um, to his first wife, Lynn, and the way in which these notionally fictional constructs are really kind of taking a hold over him. And you know, he also talks in in his some of his recordings and in um in some of his um other pieces of writing about how when you're writing fiction, you kind of you have to almost relinquish some control over your characters that they almost become autonomous, and you can't really plan what they're going to do. And I think this this really sort of profound feeling of um, almost kind of submission to that creative impulse is something that he also shares with with Warner. I mean, she definitely talks about this also in her 
biography of T.H. White. She talks about her experience of, of, um, of writing this. Like she, she recounts in her letters, you know, shortly after she'd finished the project that she'd like she'd grown so close to him as a person, even though she never really met him in life. And it's that she felt like she knew him almost. So there's kind of a sense of being haunted by this this other presence. And I suppose just in another way in which Warner and Burgess are quite quite similar, or, or there's certain connections, is that they were also just very prolific writers. And there was an aspect of their writing which was, you know, grounded in financial necessity. Not always, but I mean, you you hear Burgess talking about kind of writing as a trade and as something which is is there to you know pay the bills. Like he talks about this with his stint reviewing for the Yorkshire Post. And Warner herself actually, she wrote, she had like a long standing contract with the New Yorker, for which she wrote dozens and dozens of short stories over a long period of time. And it was that she quite openly talked about this being something which was, you know, there was a pleasant financial incentive to that. So they kind of both share a real seriousness uh, and, and, and depth in terms of thinking about their their work and, and the kind of craft of writing. But they're also, you know, thinking about it as a, a way of a mode of survival, like financial survival. That's really interesting what you say about Sylvia Townsend Warner, and, and particularly as as the writers that you're you're studying have a a, a very political uh, viewpoint as well as their artistic viewpoint. And Burgess is quite often characterised as a sort of typical male voice, uh, a typical voice of the male literary establishment. Was this your view of Burgess before you began researching in the archive uh, and, and did anything that you found in the archive challenge those preconceptions? Mm, okay, that's that's a really interesting question. I mean, I was I was kind of aware to some extent of how Burgess is often talked about as part of this kind of male literary establishment. So this was something which, you know, when I was first listening to some of the recordings, it it, it did sort of seem that way a little bit because a lot of the references he has are male writers. So, you know, he's talking about people like Ford Malux Ford, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce. And it would initially appear that he's, you know, primarily interested in, in, in male writers foremost and, and almost that he's kind of dismissive of women writers. But as I really delved into the project further and got to kind of learn more about him as a person and, and sort of listen to him talk about his ideas... I think what really stood out to me then increasingly was just the kind of the contradictory nature of him as a character and the way in which he, I think his ideas are always a lot more complex and there's, than, than he perhaps sometimes wants to let on because a lot of what shines through in the recordings is that there's this sense of kind of myth making, you know, he, he wants to almost present himself as this slightly, slightly roguish <laughs> Um, person who's who's made a name for himself as a um, a, a well respected uh, writer, and it's that you can see that sometimes there are things which are a bit of an affront to him. So, for example, um, when Virago Press awarded him the the Sexist Pig of the Year, he talks about this afterwards, and he writes in in um, articles like the article Grunts from a Sexist Pig how he's very offended by this I think he because he talks in 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 this particular article as well about how he I think rejects the idea of you know categorizing a good writer as a woman writer or a a male writer I think it's one of the things which is particularly interesting in his his ideas is how he I think he he has a very strong belief in the idea of art almost kind of transcending those sort of definitions that a, a good writer has kind of aspects of the the masculine and the feminine in them, as, as he puts it, there's elements in which he he perhaps does seem somewhat reactionary, you know, in his taking issue with um, sort of changing terminology. So, for example, using the word uh, chairperson instead of chairman. But at the same time, you think if you think of a text of his like A Clockwork Orange, you know, there's so much kind of linguistic innovation, and so that there's kind of I don't know, there's just lots of kind of really intriguing contradictions there of someone who seems to on the one hand to be resistant to to modernity or certain types of fiction but at the same time displays a real openness to this this is also seen in in you know some of the 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 female writers who he does mention so for example he he often talks about Dorothy Richardson 
one of the lesser known sort of modernist writers who uh, coined the term stream of consciousness. And so she she's writing in, in this sort of stream of consciousness mode, which prefigures Joyce. And Burgess really sort of, you can see how taken he is with that and how interested he is in that. And it's there's, you know, or, or with George Eliot, for example, he, he he talks about how she has this strong will and fine mind and how her power of probing into the human soul, you know, sort of prefigures the kind of the entire modern movement in fiction. So you can see that there are also female writers for whom he has great respect. But it's just that I think sometimes he he's only human, but he, he gets a bit annoyed when people disagree with him. But it's that, you know, I can't, I can't possibly offer a definitive answer because it's, you know, I've only been lucky enough to encounter a very small slice of, of Burgess's life and work working on this project. It's, you know, an answer. It's something for, for people to explore in far more detail, but it's that it, it's, it's impossible to see it as completely clear cut. I don't think, I don't think he is someone who can be, you know, categorized as just a, a straightforward figure of the the male literary establishment I think there's actually a lot more going on underneath the surface as well when you think about his um his relationship to to Lynn Burgess and to Liana Burgess as well you know two incredibly well-read intellectual literary women with whom he also you know had lots of kind of heated intellectual exchange I think it shows that there's it definitely bears more thinking about and and he's someone who is a lot more kind of complex than than one might first realise. And and in terms, of, you, you've listened to a lot of the recordings now. So how how much of that sort of more reaction Burgess do you think is a performance? Do you think is is him trying to sort of occupy a, a sort of showman role? I think it's definitely there, and I think it's I think it's it's often present when he's giving the public lectures, for example, because you can tell that this is him in showman mode, like you say as well, it's, you know, there's a, there's a, a larger audience. And I mean, you, you definitely see that there's a difference between, between the mode he's employing there. And then, for example, I had a chance to look at um, an unpublished typescript of a, of a seminar, which he gave, which looks like it was taking place at, um, at City College, New York. And it's that this is, you know, an insight into his kind of teaching practice. And there you see that there's, the register is really quite different. You know, he's he's talking a lot more candidly and it's that there's, you know, he's talking to a room full of young students, but there's, I mean, there certainly is kind of, there's definitely still the humour and there's, you know, him touching on familiar anecdotes like his time in Malaysia, for example, but there still seems to be something a bit more unguarded and, and it's there's nothing really paternalistic about how he's talking to these to these younger people. So I think the kind of the performative aspect is a lot more pronounced in in the public lectures and in in some of the commercial radio recordings in which he's being asked you know about his his literary career for example when he's um being interviewed by Larry King and it's that this that the performativity is probably also heightened in that particular recording because it's done as part of a press tour for um for earthly powers if i remember correctly so it's that there's there's far more of a sense of him being in in promotional mode as well of you know very much trying to kind of tailor his his answers and his interests to promoting the book whereas sometimes when he's able to kind of talk more candidly uh, as with some of the non-commercial recordings done for interviews um like with Søren Lindgren or for Per Svensson for for Swedish media you know there there are also interviews promoting the book or whatever but it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So a lot of the kind of the theatricality of it does sort of fall away. I mean, you still have the, the entertaining eccentricity and you've got, you know, conversations about Celtic mythology or, or European etymology and things, but it's, it, it's, he's a bit more kind of personable in, in those, in those more intimate settings. Well, one thing that strikes me about your work with the Burgess Foundation, you were you're a relative newcomer to the world of Burgess. How, how do you think he fits in with contemporary literary studies generally? And, and what do you think the value is of researching a writer like Burgess? I think it's, I think Burgess is someone who it's immensely valuable to study his work and his life. Because I think as a writer and as a person, he very much reflects the struggles of the kind of mid 20th century to, you know, make something new. I mean, you can really see that in terms of his lifetime. You know, he lived through World War II. He lived through 
the dissolution of the British Empire, the countercultural explosion of the 1960s, you know, the civil rights movement, all of these massive periods of change. And, you know, you can see again that there's sort of, you can see the real struggle within him and, and the way he kind of talks about modernity, that you, you can see it's someone who has who's come from a very different cultural landscape and is experiencing the shock of so many different new changes. And he's using his writing and he's using his composition as a way of trying to kind of mediate that or make sense of that. Because, I mean, again, you, you see these contradictions in him as a, as a person, like, you know, his uh, sort of famous dislike of the Beatles, for example, and this kind of resistance to modernity. But at the same time, if you take his own work, it, it's in its own way incredibly modern and innovative. You know, he's he's trying to experiment, he's trying to do new things. You know, he's talking about the future in a dystopian way in The Wanting Seed, or he's creating a new language in A Clockwork Orange. So he's, again, for someone who seems to sometimes be uneasy with, with things which are new and modern, he's at the same time also creating new things himself. So I think he really kind of exemplifies this, this struggle in society, like in the 20th century, people trying to kind of come to terms with vast social change and vast technological change and a way of still trying to kind of, you know, his work really questions whether it's possible to still retain a sense of morality or, or he's thinking about how to try and navigate this this new world. So his, his ideas are very indicative of a certain period in time and they're immensely interesting and, and worth studying for that. Okay, and and finally, what were your favourite aspects about working with the Burgess Archive? Did you have any fa- favourite sort of recordings or or favourite things you found out via the recordings about Burgess? Yeah, I think some of my favourite things were just the kind of little more unguarded sort of pockets of humanity and the moments of spontaneity. So, for example, when he's, you know, in... in in one of the interviews which he's giving for um for Swedish media, there's then his second wife Liana suddenly interjecting, and it's that then what what had started out as a an interview with him then becomes like a conversation between three people about about all kinds of interesting and unexpected topics, and so I I really have enjoyed those kind of moments of of kind of unexpectedness or or, or levity where he then suddenly makes jokes about about particular things because there's always this kind of wry self-awareness which which is runs through all of his recordings which is also very charismatic you know I think this was something that I really found particularly enjoyable working with the with the audio recordings but that was then also compounded by my visit to the archive uh, in person where it was just wonderful to be able to I mean, first of all, see the actual cassette tapes on which the original recordings have, have been kept, but also then looking at, you know, things kept in the in the archives, so so typescripts. And there was, you know, one, for example, where it's um, the typescript for novel, and you've got like a handwritten title page and felt tip pen. And then you've got on the back, you know, some drawings, which it looks like Liana has made for um, for their son, you know, to help him to learn Italian. And so... I think those things were also especially enjoyable, seeing that there wasn't, in some ways, there was never any separation between the life and the work. You know, it's all kind of going on. It's going on at the same time, and it really sort of reiterates the humanity of him as a person. Oh, uh, what what's next for you? What 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 will you you be doing after you finish at the Burgess Foundation? So after I finish my work with the Burgess Foundation, I am still going to be um, completing my doctoral studies. So it means I'm going to be returning to the world of um, interwar literature um, and, you know, being immersed in the kind of feminist preoccupations of, of writers like um, Sylvia Townsend Warner. So that's going to be my, um, my kind of life um, for the foreseeable future after I've, after I've finished working for the Burgess Foundation. Good, and, and best of luck for the, for the rest of your, your PhD studies. Um, and thanks for joining us on the Burgess Foundation podcast today. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to uh, to talk to you today. And it's just been a wonderful experience working on this project. So yeah, thank you so much. You have been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. 
For more information about the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities, visit www.rocker.ac.uk. You can read more about Milena's work in the archive and discover more about Anthony Burgess at www.anthonyburgess.org. More links are featured in the description of this episode. If you have enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to leave a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.